Welcome to this service from the Preston Ribble Methodist Circuit, led by our Superintendent Minister, the Reverend Jane Wilde, with two local preachers, Steve Gregory and me, Carol Spencer. Our call to worship this morning is based on some verses from Psalm 96, where the psalmist invites us in these words, let us come to the Lord with a new song in our hearts. Let us praise his name and declare his wonders. Let us praise his name among all peoples, for even creation praises our God and creator. Our opening chorus is also an invitation to worship and is found in Singing the Faith, number 24. Come, now is the time to worship. Good morning, I'm Carolyn Hothersall. I'm the new lay worker based at Hope and Hool Methodist Churches. Many of you will know that Longton and New Longton have been working towards coming together as one church for some time. And the new church, Hope Methodist Church, has been formed. And today at 10.45 this morning, we're holding our opening service in the car park, launching the new name, Hope Methodist Church, with new signage and signalling a new beginning. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the continued witness of the Methodist people in Longton and New Longton, as they have worked towards bringing about a new future together. We pray for your blessing as we serve you, grow together, reach out into the community, and bring your love to the surrounding areas. We pray that you will enthuse and re-energize our mission as we work our way through these challenging times under the COVID restrictions. Help us to grow the vision, to bring the love of Jesus through witness and service. We ask for your wisdom and guidance 
as we take the next steps towards the planning for the new building, as we strive to be fruitful witnesses in the area and beyond. We are a people of hope. Be with us today, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayer was written by a Ghanaian Christian. O oh God, our Father, we thank you that in Jesus Christ all may return to you and find our real identity. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that brings us from ourselves to Christ. We rejoice in the privilege of belonging to the one body of Christ and the fellowship of believers throughout the world. What do you say to introduce a service that reflects on two children? One who says yes and doesn't, the other who says no and does. Those of you who are parents may be thinking about whether any of your children fit that description. I won't comment on whether either of the descriptions fit my children. In the end, I decided there's only one way to introduce the theme, and it's to remind you of Jim Trott, played by the marvellous Trevor Peacock from The Vicar of Dibley. He'll always be remembered for no, 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 yes, which normally left those listening to him completely confused. One of my favourite recollections is when he was operating the PA for the village Autumn Fate, and he announces, no, 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 parking is allowed in the upper field. An irate driver approaches him and asks, sorry, is that no parking is allowed in the upper field, or parking is allowed in the upper field? Jim looks at him very indignantly, and as he stretches to re the, reach the microphone, announces, no, 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 parking is allowed on the upper field. Then he turns to the driver and asks, okay? I still laugh every time I see that clip. Hopefully it's brought a smile to your face, and you're ready to worship and reflect on God's word to each of us this morning. Jesus returned to the temple and began to teach. The chief priests and elders came to him and wanted to know who had given him permission to disturb the temple precincts and to teach his crazy notions in this most sacred of spots. I will answer your question if first you answer one of mine. You saw John ritually cleansing people through baptism for the redemption of their sins. Did John's cleansing come from heaven, or was he simply washing people of his own whim? The elders knew that this question was tricky. There was no simple answer. If they acknowledged that John's ritual cleansing was from heaven, Jesus would ask why they had not accepted John's authority. But if they said he had dipped people simply by his own accord, they would outrage the people who believed John was a prophet. We do not know. Then neither will I tell you about the authority under which I am working, but I will tell you a story, and you can tell me what you make of it. There was a man who had two sons. He said to his first son, Go and work in the vineyard today. No, I will not. But later, the first son changed his mind and went. Then the father went to his second son. Go and work in the vineyard today. Of course, father. But then he did not go. So which of the sons did what the father wanted? The first son. I tell you this, the tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God ahead of you. John came to show you the straight path, the path to righteousness. You did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. Even as you saw the prostitutes and the tax collectors forgiven and washed clean, finding their footing on the straight path to righteousness, still you did not change your ways and believe. This reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, and verses 1 to 13. 
as found in the message translation of the Bible. If you got anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in the community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favour, agree the, with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front, don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourself the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but he didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life then died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death at that, the crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honoured him far beyond anyone or anything ever. So that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all, to the glorious honour of God the Father. What I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've been doing from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in life and up of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God, God's energy, an energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. Amen. Jesus Christ is waiting, waiting in the streets. No place is there all alone he is. Listen, Lord Jesus, I am lonely be friend or stranger, fit to wait on you. Jesus Christ is raging, raging in the streets, where injustice follows and behold retreats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I am angry too. In the kingdom's causes, let me rage with you. sitting in church listening to Matthew 21 and feeling like I had been caught out. How did God know? 
I had times when I had said that I would do something and hadn't. But I'd never told anybody. Or then there were the times when I felt guilty and done something even though I had originally refused. It was a bit of a revelation to my teenage self that God had a handle on what I was thinking. That God understood the world as I understood it from my perspective, my inclinations and the hopes that I could avoid things I did not like. It is quite hard, although we appreciate that God understands everything that we are and will be, to know that he also doesn't like, understands the things that we don't quite like about ourselves. <clears throat> Later on in life, I was caught out again by this passage, not by the way that God understands us, but because it reflects the complexities of the mo motivations around, around why we do one thing or don't do another. How do we relate to people? There are times when we say what we think. There are times when we say what we think people want to hear. How often have we said, yes, I'm fine with that, when what we really want to say is, I am very upset because you hurt me. As human beings, God understands that we sometimes stay in unhealthy relationships because we are taking the way of ease rather than face up to the implications of speaking the truth. This passage reminds us that God comprehends us when we do things that are out of character or just plain wrong. Why we do things that are good but are uncomfortable about our actions because there is a degree of selfishness in the motivation that we have for doing them. Do you remember the Disney Pinocchio film? Pinocchio has a conscience, Jiminy Cricket. And the line in the song that he sings is, let your conscience be your friend. That does not happen for Pinocchio initially because he doesn't understand what it's like to be human. But as he grows and develops through the traumas he faces in the story, he becomes human. He begins to understand what it is to be a good boy. And a lot of that has to do with reconciling what is going on in his head with his desires and his wants. In this passage from Matthew, the two people who are asked to do what their father wanted have different responses. The reason we are uncomfortable with what is the right answer to the question, which of the two did what his father wanted, was because, in a sense, neither of them did. And it is rather close to home, because we too are controlled by our desires and our needs and our natural inclinations, rather than being able to focus solely on the will of God. And for many thousands of years, spiritual people have grappled with this idea. When I reread this passage to prepare for this reflection, the last line about belief struck me. It is okay to change our minds and believe in God. To do that, we may have to recognise that the things we have interpreted one way may not be the way things are. Just as was the challenge to the Pharisees. The God they found in the temple and the covenant was talking to them. And their understanding had a potential to grow in a relationship with God through Jesus. So has ours. But it demands that we put aside self and learn to serve God. And this takes practice. 
in the letter of Philippians that we heard earlier on in this service. Paul says that he is brought joy and encouragement by his fellow Christians who seek to love God, free from selfishness and conceit. Paul gives a clear set of instructions around how to live. He reminds us to see others as valuable and to serve those around us who God loves. The Christian writer C.S. Lewis once said, it's not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Although sometimes there may be a fine line between putting someone else first and being a doormat, which doesn't make it easy. To serve in this context is not to do what you are told, but to see the need and reach out. I remember being helped to carry a bulky item a long time ago by someone who was trying to help me. The trouble was they were very short and I am six foot one. The result was a disaster. The item broke and we both hurt ourselves. I initially thought they should have known that I could manage and was quite cross. And they thought I needed help and were equally cross. Neither of us communicated well about our need or what we were offering, or for that matter, how to do things well. The situation of service failed. And it has done over history when human beings have decided what is good for others in the name of Christ, in the name of philanthropy. The responsibility, as Paul tells us, is not to decide what is good but to serve our brothers and sisters in humility, hearing what they have to say, putting their needs above ours, putting their perception of the world in front of ours, giving as Christ gave of everything, that together we may have and be graced by the life in all its glory that God gives us. I pray that as we serve one another, as these difficult times continue, that we may not decide what is right for us, but may first ask how we serve our brothers and sisters. God bless you all. Amen. Let us pray. Our first prayer is by Janice Clark, a former mission partner. How can we believe in you, God, when we have to live in uncertainty? How can we trust you when we can see the smoke rising from the volcano? Women worry for the future of their children. Men anguish over the harvest that may not be. Children cling to their parents for fear of the dark. Where is your saving hand, O oh God? Where is your kindness and mercy? When hardship and fear abound, you are there in those who listen and take the strain. Sharing and hospitality, self-denial and benevolence are the signs of your presence. These will always be with us when you are with us. These will always remain as long as your love remains. Where are you, God, in the times of our troubles? You are always with us in the good times and the bad. You are always with us. And a prayer by Richard Jones. Today, good Lord, save us from being over-anxious about the world's pains and tragedies, about the future of the church, about the immediate challenges of life, about the ultimate future of all things and all lives. Teach us to trust in Christ, who carries the sins of the whole world, who is the head of the church, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, today and every day. Amen. Let us bring all our prayers to God as we say the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory now and forever amen Go forth now in the faith which overcomes the world, in the hope which will not disappoint you, in the love that never fails. You are ambassadors of Christ, and he is with you always. Grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Bless, preserve and protect you all this day and forever. Amen.